Hello everyone. Our guest today is Obianuju Ikotcha, the founder of Culture of Life Africa, an organization dedicated to the preservation and promotion of a pro-life culture in Africa. Her work includes mobilizing efforts to improve maternal health care services for women in Africa, while at the same time fighting against the scandal of Western governments making their support for African countries conditional on them agreeing to population control and abortion, something our guest very appropriately describes as ideological colonization. But thanks to her, the truth of what is happening is being exposed. She is a truly formidable woman and a wonderfully articulate advocate for the right to life in Africa and throughout the world. It is a great honor to introduce today Obianuju Ikotcha. We're delighted to have you with us here today, Uju. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And delighted to hear about your work. It's true, I think it's fair to say that Western countries have been to the forefront of pushing abortion and population control on, on developing countries. Can you tell us a little bit about that and who's at the forefront of that and ha you know what's happening? And this is the scandal of the 21st century, I think, at a time like this when everybody's talking about, you know, loving the black people, the Black Lives Matter and all of that. But behind the scenes, unbeknownst to most people around the world, especially in the Western world, a lot of the Western countries who are approaching African countries, pretending or claiming that are coming to be stakeholders, coming to help and partner in the work of development. Uh, and yet at the same time, they are asking for these cultural changes, these cultural things like, you know, abortion, contraception, um, the comprehensive sexuality education, and who is at the forefront of it, as you ask? It's mostly uh, a lot of the European countries. The United States at this time is now a major player, you know, since the new administration, unfortunately. So they have been pushing the African countries, they have been pushing for some of these things that we've seen as battle f battle fronts in Western countries. So particularly, you know, issues like abortion, where in the Western countries, these have been quite contested in, in the different countries. Then they come to African countries and try to get us to legalize abortion. And they are offering it at the same time as they're offering aid. So it, it kind of goes hand in hand. And it's very, very difficult for the African leaders, I must say, to, to resist this because we are very much in need of the aid, but then as we are accepting the aid at the same time, we are also having to accept some of these other uh, ideological things. So this is why I always talk about, uh, you know, ideological neocolonialism, cultural imperialism, and it's coming from Western countries, you know, from across the Western world. Absolutely. And it's really disturbing to think that yes. aid is conditional, you know, uh, on accepting, accepting these things. Tell us a little bit about the role, because of course here in Ireland, we've had abortion introduced in recent years, in the last few years. Uh, has Ireland had a role uh, in terms of, of traveling to these conferences? And you know, we know that the taxpayer here funds um, the, the, you know, the Ireland aid overseas. I'm not sure how much uh, people are aware of where that money goes to, but can you tell us a little bit about what Ireland's role has been um, in terms of, of pushing abortion on, on the developing world? Yeah, with Ireland, it has been very sad, I must tell you, Eilish. Why? Because before all of this that had happening, you must understand from the African perspective, Ireland has been a very highly respected Western voice, particularly because of the missionary work they had done in most of the African countries. Um, unlike many other Western countries, the Irish for the Africans <coughs> were seen as the perfect moral voice. I mean, most of us received the, our churches and the gospel through Irish missionaries. So then you turn to 2018 when you had your referendum and then 2019 when the result of your referendum went into play and abortion became a, you know, a legalized thing in the, in, in the Republic of Ireland. Imagine the effect it then had on the Africans. So we had a, a conference, the ICPD, International Conference on, on Population and Development, which is a major UN event, which was hosted in 2019 before COVID in Nairobi, Kenya. So that particular year, from your point of view as an Irish person, you know 2019 what it is, is the first year when you had your legalized abortion come into play, that Ireland sent a huge delegation of senators who came to the ICPD, you know, guns blazing, telling the world about how they were successful in the referendum in Ireland, talking about abortion like it's one good step that was taken in Ireland. But imagine the Africans who, for us, the Irish uh, people, uh, you know, sort of 
the, the moral voices, and then they're now the ones coming at, to the ICPD telling us about abortion. Some of your senators were telling uh, our uh, African politicians to leave the old ways. This is this is how Ireland. This is how Ireland has progressed. This is the way Ireland has gone, and this also can happen in your country, or it should happen in your country. So it's very very unfortunate. It's very interesting because I'm sure so many people are completely unaware of that yes. or unaware of the, the presence of Irish politicians at that event uh, talking about our referendum and pushing that, that as you say, uh, the ideological colonisation. Yeah. What are groups like your group, Culture of Life Africa, doing to try and address this, to, to try and pull it back, to try, is it, you know, is it educating people? What are the... What are the plans or the, what are the strategy to try and make a difference? It has been an, an uphill battle because mm -hmm. it's not just for Culture of Life Africa. There are many, many other wonderful pro-life organizations across the African continent. Mind you, Africa is an entire continent. So in the various African countries, people are making grassroots efforts, um, trying to tell people, do not buy this. This is, the, this is what has happened in the West, that even abortion is not even settled in the West. Unfortunately, those who are the loudest, those who are the most slick, the most, the coolest, if you like, the ones who are most funded are the abortion lobby and the abortion movement coming from the West. And so this is what we see and this is what we're bon bombarded with in the African country. So organizations like Out of Life Africa and many other organizations, pro-life organizations, are telling people that, you know, we're going to debunk this, that we are trying to find out exactly what is being done in the West in order for us to show that abortion, even in Western countries, has been problematic. The problems that happens in the various Af in the various Western countries and the fact that it's not all that it's promised to be. So it's mostly in education. Mm -hmm. And we are always still very much challenged because it's like a battle between David <coughs> and Goliath that who we are standing in opposition to are the powerful Western politicians. It's the international organizations like the United Nations agencies. It's is, uh, you know, the, the large media. And when I talk about media, I'm not talking about the later African country national medias. I am talking about the BBCs, the CNNs, you know, everything coming from the international world at this moment with the fall of Ireland is coming with the promotion of abortion. So we do, our work is really kind of to educate people and try to get their mindset still strengthened on the African values of life. But it's still a very, very difficult battle because we, our opponents are, are much bigger than we are. 100%. And I think, you know, we've had that experience ourselves, very much so with yeah. trying to get the information to people when you're dealing with uh, a media narrative. And that's been a huge struggle for, for Ireland and, and many countries across the world in terms of trying to get the, the pro-life issue out there. Uh, what do you think people can do? I mean, there's the viewers, viewers of this programme today. If you were to say what, what you could do to try and change things, what can pro-life activists do in Ireland and across Europe to try and make a difference? I mean, I know we always talk about, you know, getting involved in politics, electing with politicians. W what's your view on that? Uh, it's first and foremost for people to realise the fact that in as much as I'm talking about is from the African perspective, from the international perspective, that the, the single Irish uh, pro-life activist or pro-life person or even just an ordinary individual should know that this concerns you, that this is, you know, I know the, lo the local politics is always very difficult and always, you know, very overwhelming for people who are in a particular country like Ireland. <clears throat> but it is actually your business if your country is then sending money overseas and using the money instead, you know, instead of using the money for good things, for proper development work, they're using it for the lobbying of abortion, that the, the single Irish person or the ordinary Irish person should know that getting involved involved first of all getting your government to to be more clear and transparent as to how they use your overseas uh, aid budget mm -hmm. uh, trying to find out exactly the representation that your politicians are making of Ireland outside of your country, like when they went to the ICPD and they were talking about Ireland. Most Irish people didn't know that. Uh, some of us Africans, you know, it's hard to connect, to connect and see where they are coming from, even the people that they are representing. They're not really representing the voice of everyone in their own, in their own locales. So, but people should know what your politicians are doing, electing the, the right politicians, making sure to hold them accountable, making sure also that that the overseas funding that they spend is spent on right things and the things that are not, you know, that are kind of more in line with the African culture, with the African values, and, and of course, in other parts of the of the developing world. Absolutely, and it's really important to get that information out there, I think, and, yeah. and ask those really pertinent questions about the funding and the taxpayer money yeah. and where it's going and how it's being spent in developing countries. 
Let's talk a little bit about um, maternal health care because very much in Africa, it's very much used as a, you know, they promote abortion on the basis that women will die in childbirth. And, you know, th th that's why abortion is needed. We saw that very much here in Ireland before the referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment. Um, the argument was women that abortion was needed to save women's lives, even though Ireland always had extremely low maternal mortality rate and had an excellent record in maternal care. Do you think that's one of the reasons, just from your own work on a UN level internationally, do you think that's one of the reasons why the pro-abortion campaigners were so keen to see abortion in Ireland because we had this excellent maternal care and we had protection of, of unborn life in the womb? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That Ireland, before the legalization of abortion in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, had even better <coughs> maternal health outcomes than a wealthier country like the United Kingdom that, who, that had abortion, you know, and, and even people were going from Ireland supposedly to the UK for abortions. But still, your maternal health care in the Republic of Ireland was excellent. So that really reflected the point that what, what women need is excellent health care, is the, the benefit of the advancement of health care. So now they are taking the exact same argument that really didn't hold you know, any sway here in Ireland, didn't, wasn't represented by facts or, or any kind of statistics or real details because the statistics were showing the right opposite. Um, they're taking it to, uh, to African countries where they know that we have this disadvantage, that our healthcare systems are kind of run down, we have a lot of inadequacies, and as such, we are in such a vulnerable position, especially with regards to something like maternal health care or you know, maternal mortality. And they're telling us, all you have to do is to legalize abortion and then women can stop dying. Mm -hmm. But then we can still see when you look into any of the available data that when women die it, it, you know, in, in African countries, it's usually because of bleed, excessive bleeding. We don't even have uh, you know, national blood service, the kind of adequate national blood services to cover the needs of the women in most of these African countries. Uh, we are having issues with very <coughs> basic needs like the availability of water in hospitals and around healthcare facilities in diverse African countries. There are places where you go and you won't even find clean drinking water. So of course women could die uh, following childbirth from just basic or minor infections, because you don't have the the water, you know, the water services or the water sanitation. You don't have the right antibiotics. We don't have even the availability of, of healthcare professionals to take care of people. That there are places and parts of African, the African continent, where you have one healthcare professional, you know, catering for about five hundred thousand people. I mean, these are things and statistics that are real and easy to to verify. So these are the things that we need, and yet. These people come from the West and they lie to the African countries and they say what you need is abortion. Now you introduce abortion into this mix and what happens? The, the activists walk away, the lobbyists walk away and the African women will continue to die. But on the one hand, they have actually achieved what they want. So my, my appeal is always to people in the West to tell <coughs> the Africans the truth um, and, and come with the real values and the gains that you already have. You have the excellent health care here in Ireland, in the UK, in the US. Why don't you offer us that? You offer us... The, ex the, the benefits of the excellent healthcare facilities that you have, but instead all they have to offer to us, or the main thing that most of the West, these Western ideologues have to offer to us, is abortion. Uh, and it, you know, it does reek of, of um, how do you say, what I call philanthropic racism. It also does reek of, of a lot of selfishness. It's like you keep the good things to yourself, but that which is most contested within your own domains, that's what you're actually mm -hmm. ready to, to share with people. So really what we need to do is see um, an, an attention and a focus on the fundamental healthcare issues yes. and deal with those rather than foisting abortion yes. as, as a solution. Let's move on to something more positive and the US, which is we have all had a great boost from the news from the US yes. about the decision of Roe versus Wade, the overturning. What do you think are the opportunities that exist for the pro-life movement now in a post-Roe world? I know viewers of this program are really interested in this because Ever since the Roe versus Wade decision, we've had a number of conversations uh, around it, and it's given us, particularly in Ireland, the fact that we've had abortion introduced in the last few years, um, a real shot in the arm. It's yes. been a real boost. So what, what would you think are the opportunities that are there um, for the pro-life movement uh, post-Roe? Yeah, 
yeah, it's a very exciting time that now we are we're now going to be ready to um, to go forward with more courage. You see what the Americans have done right that the Americans, <clears throat> uh, you know, the American pro life politicians, the American pro life activists, they have no apologies and they have no, you know, they they. They are, they are not ashamed to stand as, the, as pro-life people and then still say, we can be pro-life and then we are pro-science, we're pro-woman, we are doing everything possible in order to help women who are in need. And so they've, of course, had this uh, you know, exceptional and excellent uh, victory. So what I'm hoping for in the, in the post war world is the fact that, that their enthusiasm uh, the, and the, this, the, the effervescence within their own pro-life movement can actually pour into, <coughs> into other places like Ireland and other, and other parts of the world. The fact also that, that we can then, removing abortion from the mix, especially from some of these American states that are pro-life, we can then see clearly, just like, you know, to allude a little bit to what we had talked about earlier, we can then see clearly to what really helps women uh, and what women really need. Because without abortion in the mix, we can then see maternal health care. We can take care of the real business of taking care of pregnant women and their babies. Um, and then we can replicate that because if you can see that women can still do well, uh, we can have very good maternal health care outcomes without abortion. So yes, we can we can we can actually uh, try to spread that around the world, uh, especially in parts of the world where abortion has not been legalized and they don't want to legalize abortion. And people are coming with the lie that if you legalize abortion, all things are going to be better. Oh, we, we will have somewhere to look because, of course, we now no longer have Ireland. We cannot make a reference to the kind of healthcare outcomes we have in Ireland because now you have abortion. But uh, America, thank God, you know, it's now an, like an open and another sort of an open opportunity for us to see properly how innovative ways, how we can help pregnant women, help women in pregnancies, in crisis pregnancy situations, help women in post delivery situations and, and take care of the real medical advancements. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that mm -hmm. uh, without, without abortion uh, destroying all that, you know, that is good within medical advancements. And it's interesting that in America, I suppose there's a huge uh, focus from within the pro-life movement mm -hmm. on practical support yes. for, for women uh, in unplanned pregnancy and helping women with crisis pregnancy resource centers, at abortion clinics, etc. And we often hear, and we see on social media about lives that have been, have been saved. You know, I think it's really something maybe that should be developed more in other countries and in other pro-life movements to have more of that to the front, to the forefront, yes. that we're pro-life in every sense and, and assisting mothers. Do you think that the... Um, like the, the, the movement in America is well, it's very well organized. We have a lot of very committed people. It's very positive. And if that could be replicated, um, so this is kind of a tipping point of pro-life activism where everybody, it's acceptable to be involved. Compared to places like Ireland where it's quite difficult to be a pro-life activist at the mm -hmm. moment. Is that something that in terms of an opportunity post role we should try and develop in other countries, especially in Europe? Or is that something that... Well, absolutely. Because what is what doing is what doing well. Mm -hmm. Within the pro-life movement, um, you have a lot of amazing people. You have people who are, I think, some of the most generous people I've met in, in my lifetime. I have met them within the pro-life movement. Some of the kindest people I've met, I've met them within the pro-life movement. But what we need also, in addition to all that exceptional love within the pro-life movement, is um, the kind of the pursuance of professionalism. We need more professionals to be able to also come into this movement. We need to welcome people. We need to, you know, we need to kind of not just welcome, but we need to attract um, this, like high practicing professionals, lawyers, doctors, um, you know, people in, in various walks of life to come into our movement and help the women, you know, pregnant women, women in crisis pregnancy. And that's what you have in the United States. You have a movement that is uh, very well organized, very enthusiastic, of course, that has all the love that you, love is never lacking in the pro-life movement, I tell you, love is never lacking. But sometimes what we lack is just the resources and the profession, the kind of high professionalism that you need to get this movement to stand shoulder to shoulder with other movements, if you see what I mean. So, so it's, it's one that has also been very difficult because in most of these Western countries, um, in a place like Ireland, it will be hard to be like a high-flying high lawyer 
who is unapologetically pro-life or a very highly accomplished doctor and be unapologetically pro-life. There is always some kind of attack against you to either make it such that so that pro-life people would look like we are stupid or, you know, we're, or we're not professionals or we, we cannot be professional and pro-life at the same <clears> time. But I want this world where we can merge the two because what is what doing is what doing well. We want, I want to see more professionals and that's what we see in the United States. And I think that's, that also kind of is responsible or, or could have been responsible for the kind of successes that you have within the movement. I also think people should be, um, you know, ordinary people who perhaps are not very activists in nature. I think they should just uh, kind of have the heart to support the pro-life movement. If you are pro-life and you have this this uh, thing within your mind where you understand that, of course, more than anything, life should be protected at every stage and phase of development, but then you do not want to be activist, fine. Then please give to the pro-life movement. Please sponsor the pro-life movement that those who cannot, you know, give can go. Those who cannot go can give, you know. So it's, it's that kind of a situation. I think I'm working a lot with the American pro-life movement. I've seen a lot of that, that sometimes it's the people who do not necessarily want to get involved in activism who give as much as they can or as much as is possible to the movement because this is a very important human rights movement. It should be taken as such. It should be considered as such. And it, you know, it, it, it should get the kind of support that it needs to be able to stand because we do have to stand on something. And a lot of love is great, but we also need like to be able to afford uh, the kind of professionals and the level of professionalism which is needed within a movement to make it formidable that will carry us into the future. Absolutely agreed. And I think it's really interesting what you've said about just professionalizing the pro-life movement. Mm. And, you know, it's amazing to see so many amazing pro-life organizations all over the world. But it's, you know, it's a challenge to do that. And obviously there's resources and all of those issues. But we need to really look at the US, see what they've done and try and kind of emulate that replicate, in other parts of yeah. the world and replicate. Uh, so that's a real challenge for us. But it's, it's absolutely really worthwhile and important. Mm. Just in terms of um, your own activism. So you're a massive activist, you've traveled all over the world, far and wide, you've seen the good and the bad, you've worked with the U at the UN level, with other, you know, internationally. What makes you hopeful that the tide will turn? Uh, you know, what, and, you know what, what keeps you going? Yeah. And uh, how do you see, uh, I mean, ultimately, we believe that life will be protected again in law. Yes. So what are your own kind of views on, the, on how that will happen? I mean, how do you, you know, keep motivated around that? Of course, so in my, Let's say my professional life, I work as a scientist, a medical scientist, so I do work in the healthcare, um, in the healthcare system and healthcare services. And the one thing that I have seen over the years, I have been in this industry for about you know, 20 years now, uh, much of my life I have, I have been working as a healthcare professional, and I have seen incredible advances within the healthcare, you know, in the, in the world of health, healthcare uh, provision and healthcare uh, advancements. I have seen such advancements that I know for a fact that surely um, with the, especially how all things like ultrasound are going and then how you see women are being cared for in pregnancy, how you see babies are being born earlier and earlier within pregnancy and gestational ages. I know that the advancement at some point is going to have to overtake the barbarism of abortion, mm -hmm. that people who are you know, committing these abortions and on the one side, you have, uh, you know, fetal surgeries where even within the womb, doctors are having to operate on babies to correct spina bifida and, bifida and things like that. So it's, it, I know that one day the science will surely have to be confronted by, by the, uh, you know, the practice, the barbaric practice that is abortion. That gives me hope. Uh, I also have worked with a lot of young people and seen young people in various countries. And I know that there is indeed a genuine desire to protect the, the most vulnerable, to protect the weakest, to protect the smallest. And so if that is the case, there is just that zeal. And then on the one hand, we are seeing these babies, we are seeing the baby photos, we are seeing the ultrasound pictures, we are getting science, you know, revealing more and more to us about the humanity of the baby in the womb, even at earlier and earlier stages. 
I believe that one day the young people will rise, that the, that the coming generation will definitely see that there is no way we can be doing a, a surgery, you know, a cardiac surgery on a baby in the womb, but at the same time being able to, to kill that baby while in the womb. So there is a lot of hope out there because the advancements continue irrespective of the, the darkness that has come from, from within the abortion movement and the lies that they are trying to propagate and things that have that have kind of, you know, grown over the last uh, half a century up to where it is now. Uh, the, the time is coming. The time is coming when, when the true and the good will have to confront that uh, which is evil and deadly and has cost so many lives that, you know, one day it will happen. And we've seen a lot of human rights abuses over time and what happened, has happened in history. We've seen what happened with slavery. Myself as a black person, uh, it's, slavery is something that I have thought a lot about. And of course, we, without, you know, with, without uh, much difficulty, I have compared it with abortion and I've seen the similarities between what, what happened during the days of slavery, the laws that were involved in order to make it possible, the, the, the kind of propaganda that had to go into it in order to make it possible, the very difficult position people were put in and the persecution that would have happened around those who were trying to abolish uh, slavery. And I see that in a way, you know, I compare it in a way to what is happening within the pro-life movement, to pro-life activists, to pro-life uh, people and what is what is happening in our world. And I know that, yes, if if I myself as a black person of, at this point in time, because of the work people have done to abolish what was before, that I can stand and I can talk freely and I can be in any society and, and talk to anybody and conduct business and do whatever. Um, I know that indeed, uh, one day the humanity uh, of the baby in the womb will be recognized that, that they too are equal, you know, babies and human of equal right and dignity and, and what as anybody else. So I'm very hopeful. And you're yeah, so right. I mean, the humanity, the window to the womb is probably one of the most influential things yes. that's happened in the last half a century in yeah. terms of really people realizing that this is a human being. Uh, thank you so much for being with oh, us, Uju. You. you have uh, hun over 130,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> if they you're, let me. <laughs> you're, you're, you're an incredible digital activist as well. So um, thank you so much for being thank with you. us today. Thank you. And for anybody who'd like to follow Uju, um, you can follow her Twitter account, Obi and Uju Ekacha on Twitter, and see more about what she's getting up to. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Alice.